Welcome to China Dispatches, the official podcast of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. This is Jacob Gunter, the Chamber's Senior Policy and Communications Manager. This episode is a recording of our Summer 2020 VIP webinar series, which featured government, business, and thought leaders from around the world having frank discussions on tough topics with Chamber President Jörg Wutke. If you're tired of long speeches and looking for lots of back and forth, you've come to the right place. If you enjoy the conversation, have a look at our website and sign up for future webinars so you can enjoy them live and even ask questions of our speakers. Without further ado, let's jump right into the topic. The EU and China in 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome from Beijing. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you online. And it is definitely a pleasure for me to greet you here from the European delegation uh, in Beijing. And I'm joined by the uh, ambassador, Nicolas Chapuy. Uh, we do this in particular because tomorrow is the uh, day of Europe. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, that gives us every reason to be here uh, in order to celebrate this. But this is also a birthday party. Uh, the European Chamber was founded 20 years ago, and uh, this is our big party this month. On top of it, um, I must say, being German, I, uh, of course, am very much aware of 8th of May, which is 75 years after the war, Second World War ended. Um, and to me, that is a significant uh, date. Uh, my father was one of the troops that invaded France and also invaded the Soviet Union. And as you can see now, my ambassador is French and my wife is uh, Russian. And that just shows uh, how over time uh, Europe has uh, found uh, ways and means in order to overcome this, in particular in the European Union, uh, uh, created a peace zone, not just an economic zone. So European Day means a lot to me personally for that very reason. Yeah, we have uh, three eminent speakers. We have the A team here today. Uh, we have uh, uh, Phil Hogan, the sitting uh, European Commissioner for Trade, uh, an old friend of ours when he was already Agriculture uh, Commissioner. We have uh, Jacob Wallenberg. Uh, he's based in Sweden. Uh, he is uh, head of the investor, which of course you can relate to ABB and Eric's and other places. Uh, he was chairman of uh, SA Banken. So Jacob has been in and off, uh, in and out of China since 84 in real old China hand. And then we have Marcus, uh, the head of the Business Europe uh, organization in Brussels. He's dialing in from Austria. So we have a real good international representation here. So before we start, uh, I give the floor to our ambassador, Nicolas. Well, uh, uh, good afternoon from Beijing. And as uh, Jorge just said, uh, this uh, seminar today is the first of a series that the EU Chamber of Commerce is organizing this month to celebrate its 20th anniversary. Just two days ago, we marked also the 45th anniversary of EU-China diplomatic relations, and it shows how much the chamber and this delegation are in sync. The recent issue of The Economist was titled The 90% Economy. Now, the missing 10% is what requires now our full and immediate attention, especially in China, where the new normal has started. The EU-China economic and trade relations are strongly impacted by the pandemic worldwide. EU businesses in China today face the disruption of the supply chains and are still unable to organize a smooth return of their expatriate personnel and of their dependents. They also face a growing anti-foreign sentiment linked to the elevation of tensions in international relations, especially between the US and China. And so to define in uh, present circumstances, EU, China economic and trade policies, it is my privilege to introduce the EU Commissioner for Trade, Phil Organ. The Commissioner knows particularly well China, and I recall fondly his last visit uh, in November 2019. 
his former action as commissioner for agriculture has led to unprecedented level of EU-China agricultural trade to the benefit of EU farmers. Now, as trade commissioner, he detains the keys of a rebalancing of the existing asymmetries in the EU-China relationship. Commissioner, if you are online. See him? Okay. He has not yet dialed in. Yeah. Phil, Phil, can you give a sign of uh, hope? <laughs> Anyhow, maybe Phil, uh, let's see. We, we then maybe just ask Jacob uh, uh, to chip in a couple of thoughts uh, before then Phil takes the floor. So Jacob, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, Jörg, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, Ambassador, uh, let me just say that I'm, I'm indeed very honored to be part of this celebration of, of the Chamber. Uh, I have uh, over many years personally been engaged in China's economic integration. I, I'm a member of the International uh, Advisory Council to the Mayor of Shanghai since over 20 years, and, and I'm a, a member of the Advisory Council of the Tsinghua University in Beijing, amongst others. So I, I followed the Chamber's activities through its entire existence and I believe it remains one of the best manifestations of European collaboration that I've actually seen anywhere uh, and we're very grateful for the work that has been carried out and for your efforts in this year as well as your predecessors it's, it's been really really great now I think it's impossible not to start by just mentioning the COVID-19 pandemic especially since I believe it amplifies my broader message on EU-China relations. I really believe that the pandemic should be a reason for us to promote increased collaboration. Just as the spread is without borders, so should our response be borderless. Experiences and best practices should be shared. Data, research and equipment should be common goods and transparency is of course paramount to this. As we have multilateral institutions, they should be used as a platform for all partners, in particular, in particular China and the US to collaborate and to solve problems together. How difficult that is can be seen by the current lack of cooperation on COVID-19. And I think we all have, have this responsibility to collaborate. And I believe that China being ahead of the rest in returning from the lockdown has a special and a very important role to play here. That said, let me turn to the topic of the day, the EU-China relation, where it stands and what it may hold for the future. I first visited China in 1984. At that time, as we all know, there, there were literally rice fields where there are now R&D centers and high rises. This image to me, though, illustrates the most obvious global trend during the last decade. The growing economic power of Asia and the economic integration of China. This success story is the result of China's extraordinary receptiveness and ability to absorb and generate knowledge but also a testimony to the strength of mutually beneficial commercial relations. To me, history tells me that the European relationship with China first and foremost offers great opportunities today as well as tomorrow in the same way as our relationship with the United States does. China is today an integral part of the global economy and an indispensable partner in addressing global challenges such as climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the development of world trade, amongst others. I see how far the economic integration of China has gone from the companies I'm involved with. For Ericsson, China has been a key market for more than 120 years, is an important base for both R&D and manufacturing. And for ABB, China is the second largest market worldwide with nearly 20,000 employees in R&D, manufacturing, sales and services. Therefore, the discussion about decoupling 
China from the rest of the world is somewhat detached from the practical reality. It would ruin value, efficiency and productivity. It would hinder R&D and force the rest of the world into a difficult, damaging and dangerous choice between parallel systems. At the time of China's entry into the WTO, the general hope was that the international economic integration would lead China towards further liberalization, political reforms, the rule of law, as well as greater openness and transparency. A lot has indeed happened, but much remains to be done. And sadly, the current trend appears in recent times to be going in the wrong direction. Today, there is an imbalance in economic conditions between the EU and China. If allowed to increase this imbalance, I believe, will lead to an unnecessary competition between our system of a liberal, open and social market economy and China's state-dominated economy. We see a more assertive China using all instruments at its disposal to rapidly develop its industrial capabilities. We unfortunately also see European companies in China still impacted by state interventionism, unfair trade practices, and I believe from time to time, unfair treatment. While we salute the opening of industrial sectors, including the financial sector, foreign bank share of total assets in China is less than 2% and actually decreasing. Although, we all understand that political reforms do take time. It is crucial for me as a business leader to be able to register an openness to discuss societal issues. My credibility as a responsible owner is at stake if violations of civil rights take place where we have operations, obviously. Recent events in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and some consular cases also involving my own country, are in this respect factors detrimentally affecting the broader relationship. Now, as a friend of China, I have consistently highlighted these issues to Chinese leaders to explain and to instill our perspectives. When looking at the future, my conviction is that the European approach towards China must be built upon the concept of mutual inclusion rather than isolation. The goal must be for China to become a responsible stake stakeholder in the rules-based world order, not a systemic rival. This will require real efforts and engagements from both sides through negotiations and hard-fought agreements. Europe needs to take serious steps to become a strong, united, demanding, and capable partner of China. We need to get rid of our naivety and sometimes outright ignorance in relation to China and ensure equal terms and a level playing field as guiding principles. Business may be less naive when it comes to China, but we business need to be more assertive when demanding equal treatment in China. Having said that, I believe that we at the same time must radically deepen our knowledge about China, the Chinese language, its culture and history. And China for its part must instill a sense of trust and predictability in relation to Europe. This can only be done by allowing for much more transparency and openness and respect for a common set of rules. China must send a clear signal that they're ready to assume a greater responsibility for the world economy and conduct diplomacy in a mature way. All in all, I believe China, Chinese markets and Chinese consumers stand to benefit greatly from allowing foreign companies a greater market access in China, in the same way as Chinese companies have gained access and developed into the EU market. And from what I have seen since I first visited China in 19, 1984, this belief is also firmly anchored in history. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacob. That sounded like uh, you put a lot of pressure on the European Chamber to even act and not be better. 
I very much appreciate your candid statements, and I'm sure we come back to this in our Q&A session. I think that now Phil is on the line, the Commissioner for Trade of Europe. So, Phil, the floor would be yours if you can hear me. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Very well. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, Chairman, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning from Brussels. I hope you're all managing as best you can in these very unusual times. So I want to start by thanking the European Chamber of Commerce in China and Business Europe for the invitation to participate in today's webinar. Uh, my colleagues and I always appreciate the work that you do on behalf of European companies. And of course, I've seen for myself the great impact that you're making on the ground during my recent mission to China in November, and indeed on many other occasions. We also appreciate the many papers that you publish and uh, the various tomes of experiences that you bring to our attention from companies uh, who are in, at the cold face, as it were, in relation to doing business on a daily basis. Um, I want to take the opportunity to wish the Chamber a happy 20th birthday. Uh, your anniversary falls on a very important day and a very important time, and for, it coincides with uh, 45 years of EU-China relations. And uh, these are important milestones, and I think we can safely say that the EU-China relationship has come a very long way in those times. So we are faced, of course, now with a totally new set of challenges uh, with many unknown outcomes. Uh, so your work and your unique position of influence will be even more important as we construct our strategies for to have economic recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're facing not only an unprecedented health crisis, but also an unprecedented economic crisis. I, I expect it will be uh, as bad as it was uh, in 100 years ago or even worse. So it will affect all sectors of our society and our economies. So we have published in recent days our expectations in terms of the economic forecast for this year, and they're very depressing. The economic shock has been uh, very difficult on a number of fronts, Demand has dropped, supply chains are disrupted, investments are on hold, and the banking sector has seen again a surge like some years ago in non-performing loans. So the world will be different and we will require a concerted global effort to steer things in the right direction. And there's a strong risk that we may see, may see an acceleration of pre-crisis trends, such as the weakening of the multilateral system and increased calls for de-globalization. And here in the Europe, and in the European institutions, we've been working with member states to address these, uh, this crisis on all fronts and address these issues. Health policy, of course, is the competence of member states, so therefore the Commission and the European institutions can only do so much. But what we've been trying to do is to coordinate efforts in member states by supporting increased manufacturing of PPE in Europe, by waiving uh, import tariffs and value-added tax on a temporary basis, by engaging in joint procurement for essential medical supplies and medical equipment with member states, and of course supporting the scientific and the research efforts in order to find a vaccine and find solutions to this particular problem. In the economic sphere, we have taken measures through the Eurogroup Agreement that provides a safety net of work for workers and businesses and public finances. Of course, the ECB have done a lot as well in terms of liquidity. Uh, but the Commission is also working to ensure the smooth delivery of goods in the internal market, thanks to the creation of priority lanes, or what we call them green lanes for freight transport. We're pushing for coordinated global responses, as well as the, our international organizations like the WTO and the G20, and through international initiatives like the International Pledging Conference last Monday, which was a great success and generated $8 billion. Of course, some things will be different post-coronavirus, and the, the vulnerabilities that are apparent in the global value chains need to be addressed. And there are many different views and many different approaches uh, to this conversation. But I think it will, it will be necessary to diversify and supply and solidify supply chains, which will make our economies less vulnerable in the future in critical areas. I'm thinking particularly of the health area. An open trade policy, in my view, is essential for a successful economic recovery plan. And for companies of all sizes to reap the benefits of trade in the recovery phase, we need stability and predictability in the trading environment. So we are making the case in Europe forcibly at international level uh, because we are convinced that a global crisis requires a global response. That's why 
at the latest G20 ministers' conference uh, and, and statements that were issued, uh, we didn't get the ambition that we would like, but we made some progress. But I'm working to see can we even get more ambition with our G20 members to preserve the free flow of goods, notably medical equipment and also food. The World Trade Organization is an essential actor as well in terms of adapting to the rules of the 21st century, but also helping uh, with the fallout from this crisis. In the short term, it should help to ensure transparency and monitoring of trade and investment related measures taken in response to the pandemic. We need to lift the restrictions as soon as possible that are put in place during this crisis. And the EU, EU is exploring how to facilitate the trade of medicines and protective equipment, including the elimination of tariffs. And I think this can be achieved via an update of the WTO pharmaceutical initiative, and we can get more countries to join this initiative. So we need global rules to maintain stability and predictability. Therefore, we have to redouble our efforts in relation to WTO reform. We need a rules-based system supported by a functioning dispute settlement mechanism. So we're ready in the EU to engage with others to overcome the latest deadlock that we have on the appellate body and independent appeal system. We've set up a, a stopgap uh, arrangement of arbitration uh, with 18 other WTO members. We call it the Multi-Party Interim Appeal Arbitration Arrangement, or MIPA, MPIA. And this EU-led initiative is now in effect since last Friday. The process of putting it in place, uh, a pool of ca high caliber arbitrators has already begun, and we have completed this job in June. Now, Chairman, I just want to say a few words about the, what I see as the present state of play on EU-China relationships and, the, and the, our investment agreement negotiations, our investment negotiations. So I think that what we need is more uh, collaboration with outside the European Union with our free trade agreements and our investment negotiations. So I have tried to intensify the debate around China's growing political, economic, and technological influence. So COVID-19 has not changed the Commission's overall analysis, where we describe in our summit last year and in our communication last year that we see China as a partner, but also an economic competitor, competitor and a systemic rival. On that basis, we will continue our work in implementing the actions that we outlined in the China-EU communication of 2019. We have to upgrade our trade defense toolbox. We're doing that in trying to help us to level the playing field, to put pressure on China and others uh, to have this level playing field. In the, you know, it's in the interest of our European countries. This includes investment screening and the ongoing discussions on a, a new international procurement instrument. And what that instrument really is about is that we need reciprocity in terms of market access for our companies. So we have a very open internal market in the European Union, and we have no difficulty in opening up to China and others. But we don't get the same market access in, in, in terms of reciprocity. So our international procurement instrument would give us uh, some leverage in order to ensure that that would happen. So under the guidance of our Executive Vice President, Margaret Vestager, work, we have ongoing work going on as well in relation to the start of effects created by foreign subsidies in the single market and how to address foreign access to EU public procurement and EU funding. Now, I want to underline the work that both the Chambers and in particular Business Europe are doing to provide us with the views of European business in these matters. And the case you make for fair trading conditions everywhere, whether in outside markets or within the EU single market, is very influential. And I want to encourage you. It's clear that Europe is open for business, but what we want is fair competition. We are not uh, against competition, but we want fairness. And this is why the Commission and the Member States understand the importance of having an appropriate toolkit. We remain in contact with our Chinese counterparts throughout the COVID-19 crisis. We depend on them for a lot of medical supplies and medical equipment. We've had recent discussions with Vice Premier Liu Hai, and uh, we're going to have a summit on the 4th of June between China and the European Union. It'll be, and, and that would be preceded by a conversation that I will have with the Minister for Trade, Zhang Shan, in, in a high-level dialogue. So we have talked about enhancing global coordination in the context of the crisis, as well as difficulties faced by EU and Chinese companies in relation to exports of medical supplies. There was a change in the quality certification of those supplies in April, which caused a lot of distress and frustration in the European Union for to get these supplies to our member states. But these measures now have been uh, reversed and addressed, and on the 1st of May, we have a new regime in place that is very similar to what was the situation before the 1st of April. We, are, we have had a round recently of our uh, EU-China investment negotiations. We're not there yet. Of course, we, we need to see more Chinese ambition and market access 
in order to rebalance the existing asymmetry in the levels of market openness and meaningful disciplines, notably in state-owned enterprises and subsidies, we need to see uh, China agreeing with us what is the definition of the level playing field for EU companies in China and non-sustainable development. Concluding these negotiations this year will depend on China's ambition. So it's from our point of view, it's substance over speed. We have some difficult issues to talk about yet, but we're doing our best to push things along and we keep pushing on market access in our talks. Um, and we are monitoring the implementation as well of the US-China Phase 1 agreement. Vice Premier Liu Hai has confirmed that there should be no discrimination against the European Union, and we will be following up with the relevant ministries, including next week, uh, in how they are going to give the European Union companies the same latitude and same concessions that they've given to the United States companies. Should companies experience difficulties, it is important that they let us know through our delegation in Beijing or in Brussels. So we're looking forward to the next EU-China summit, but the exact date has not been confirmed, but I expect, it, I expect that we will have a conversation uh, along the lines I mentioned in early June. We have an informal leaders meeting foreseen for Leipzig in September, and, and it's a, we expect that that would go ahead. So, Chairman, I'm going to conclude there by, again, looking forward to working closely with the Chamber of Commerce in China and Business Europe. Companies and policy makers need to work closely together in this time more than ever. You have the insights that are always helpful to me, helpful to my uh, services. So we keep encouraging you. Uh, you are at the epicenter of the crisis as well. So whatever lessons we can learn, we can learn with the help of your experience. We have to increase the resilience and sustainability of our supply chains. How do we see the response to concerns about the reliability of investments in production in China is something I'd be interested in. And this will require choices from the Chinese leadership. And of course, this will also be something that we'll be pushing through the investment negotiations. So the European Union is willing to do what is necessary to address this global crisis with all our global partners, because I believe that trade policy is a key to ensuring economic recovery. So thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, it's great uh, to have you on board. And in particular, with your statements, you will trigger a lot of questions, I can imagine. Now, let me turn to our bigger brother, the Business Europe, uh, Secretary General uh, Marcus Breyer. Uh, Business Europe is, is a very dear partner to us. It's our anchor in Europe. So I'm very pleased that we could actually do this here together. So, Marcus, uh, give us your thoughts. Yes, you hear me? Yes, very well. Very well. Well, first of all, thank you, Jörg, for, for organizing and, and also Happy birthday, and let me say how much we value uh, the collaboration, uh, the cooperation with uh, EU-China uh, Chamber, and you specifically. So, so I think we have done a lot of things together over the years, and and really thank you for this. Uh, also, thank of course the Commissioner for his uh, encouraging words and for being with us. Thanks a lot, Phil, and also of course thank Jakob uh, for for his inspiring words. Which I, which I very much share. And let me also say, huh? let, me, let me also say uh, congratulations to the ambassador and thanks for hosting us and congratulations for the 70th uh, anniversary. Uh, and I think we see in these days, even so in the early days, uh, the European level was, was, was much criticized. We see how much we need it. And we also see that we can also find an answer to the, to the incredible crisis we're in together first in Europe and I totally agree with Phil, we need to find also a global answer uh, to a global problem, where, which the virus has been. I'll start by saying some words about the virus without going into too much details or about the economic impact. I mean, uh, Phil has alluded already to the fact that of course this is the deepest economic crisis we will have seen in peacetime since the 30s of the last, of the last uh, century. Um, and, and obviously we went from a supply shock to now a demand side problem and, and we have deep impacts in many uh, of our businesses. Um, I must say we are very grateful for the support we get from the Commission. We have real-time reporting schemes to, to DG Trade on the problems we have globally and to DG Grow in, on the problems we have inside the, the European single market. One of the direct consequences was these green lanes, which was very important because we started, we started at the beginning of the crisis with borders closed down and with 30 to 50 kilometers 
for instance, between Italy and my home country, truck uh, jams, and 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 uh, luckily we were able, and the Commission was able to overcome this uh, with this green lane. So I, I would say this is this is very uh, important. I don't need to repeat the figures. We we know how deep the crisis is. Uh, we are dealing with the response, of course, and of course this goes in three steps. I think the emergency uh, measures to with the goal to keep as many companies alive and as many workers in work are well underway. Uh, so, 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 so this is important. We are very much, of course, now in the, in the exit phase, where at the same time we need to acknowledge differences in member states. Of course, we need to make sure that the exit fa phase is as coordinated as possible, because otherwise it will not be able to, to really restart the complex value chains we have across the continent, and and this is uh, this is uh, crucial. And I also I've read a, I've read a good piece from Jakob in the FT. I think uh, it's very important that we do this in a risk-based way. And we are having a lot of debate with debates with politicians, and we we all know that, for instance, in Brussels we still have the paratroopers in the streets, because for politicians it's always difficult to take adverse decisions. Uh, but in this case, we will need to have a risk-based approach and, of course, go back to economic activity like it happens in many countries in order to be able to, to, to return uh, to a world uh, we would like to see. And now, of course, it's very much about the recovery plan. Again, without going into details, let me underline that we in Business Europe have, uh, of course, with all kinds of caveats, but we very much came to the conclusion that we will need a strong recovery fund and we will need fresh money to kickstart the European economy again. Of course, we'll need to use it well. I think the word, it's not just bounce back, it's bounce forward. We will need to make our economy, of course, stronger. And we agree that this economy should be greener, uh, more based on digital, but we also, we also say it needs to go beyond. So meaning it's very important to also make it more resilient and to have a strong industrial strategy beyond the two buzzwords, which are absolutely right, but uh, which, uh, which will need to be complemented by a strong industrial strategy in order to really get Europe back on track. I mean, so far for the situation we are in, we are grateful for the good cooperation we have with all the institutions, but of course we know that st we still have a long way uh, to go uh, to, to, to come back on track. On the EU-China relationship as such, and on the question I've been asked whether whether COVID has an impact on this. And of course, this is something everybody is, is interested in. Um, I mean, of, I th think it's, it's still too early to, to assess whether, whether there will be a lasting uh, or, or what will be the impact. Uh, of course, we very much share that, that, that uh, concluding the China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment would be a key step forward. But at the same time, I'm totally with Phil uh, substance above speed. I mean, we really need to get, uh, we really need to get to make a step in leveling the playing field in order uh, to uh, to have this uh, to have this uh, to have this a decent step. Uh, Phil was, I mean, this was still before the crisis, and it was in person. So in January, Phil gave us the pleasure to present our our. Hmm? It's fine, we can still hear you. Yeah, very well. To present our EO China strategy together with him. And I mean, this goes a bit in the same direction as, uh, as Jakob has already alluded to. Uh, we want a stronger and fairer economic relationship with China, but in order to do so, we will need to rebalance it. There's a number of concerns and irritants which have been there before the crisis, which of course have not gone away uh, in the Chinese market, but also in the European market and also in third country markets. And, and we will need to make steps here. And of course, uh, best way would be to limit state interference in China, but this is not likely to happen. So therefore, uh, we, will need to, we will need to have our own toolbox and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Phil alluded to it. We will need to have our own toolbox in order to, to level the playing field and, uh, and to, 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 to be sure that we deal with the systemic challenge. And uh, to just to bring you one example, um, of course, Phil has already brought a, a very good and long list. I mean, one of the, we have proposed 130 concrete recommendations in order to, to balance the, the playing field. 
And one, ex one, one example is the state-owned enterprises instrument, where we would see the necessity of reversal of the burden of proof when it's about, for instance, uh, uh, industrial subsidies, because we see that, I mean, the, the trigger by the state-owned enterprises is one of the routes or the route where the distortion is felt the most uh, in Europe. On the outlook, how will and how should this develop? Um, I, I think I totally agree with what has been said and what uh, specifically Jakob said. It would be, it's absurd to talk about decoupling because I mean, we, we know about the reality and, and, and we want to make, and of course, let's say the, the way the US deals with China is not making it easier. And of course, we're very concerned about recent developments where where the US is at least discussing going to an extra territoriality we have never seen before. I mean, uh, basically uh, making rules for also European companies when they deal with China. So, so we will have to have a clear discussion on this. Uh, but at the same time, um, it's also very clear that, that we, will, uh, we, will need to, uh, we will need to continue to address the issues uh, of balance and the debate, as Phil said, the debate how we will make our value chains more resilient uh, and more diversified is there. And, and it will continue to be there in Europe. And it's, it's uh, of course, it is a justified debate, but of course it will be important to spin it in a way uh, that of course this doesn't lead in the direction of self-sufficiency, because this is also what some people are talking about. And, and I think this is pure nonsense. But, but it will have an impact and, and we will need to, 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 to lead this debate well. And I think what we are seeing now is, is a trend we have seen starting in 2008, is that the times of the, let's, what, what has been called hyper-globalization uh, is maybe coming to an end. And, but at the same time, we will need to look uh, after a fine uh, balance here. And this is why we also, I mean, first, of course, want to balance our relationship with China. We want to make it stronger, but we think we can only make it stronger if uh, China takes the necessary steps to go in the direction of a balance. And at the same time, we also want to diversify our value chains in the world and our markets in the world. This is why we very much support the Commission and feel in a in a, in a very uh, ambitious bilateral trade agenda, like for instance, the revision of the Mexico agreement recently, and very much, and then we really hope that we'll also get the support of the German presidency on this, which looks like at the time being to bring home, to bring home the Mercosur agreement to diversity. So to, to sum it up, of course, there is also this debate about greater strategic autonomy in Europe. Um, and, uh, and this debate will be ongoing, but I think we must not forget that all these will need to have feasible business models. And, and of course, the debate very much is about pharmaceutical at the time being. And what I always underline in my debates with the European politicians and, uh, and the institutions is, there was a lot of underlying framework condition reasons why these value chains have moved. So, so if the aim is to, 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 to have a change in these value chains, I mean, uh, without addressing these, uh, uh, these framework conditions, I mean, this will simply not happen. So, so we will have to have uh, a base, uh, a, 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 a balanced uh, debate here. But uh, as I said, to sum it up, I think Europe will need to, I mean, first continue to, to become stronger itself and this is what I said before, bounce forward, this is key, but at the same time to try to make the relationship with China stronger, but I mean this means we will need to make it more balanced, more reciprocal, and we will need to address the irritants which have been there before the crisis, which have not gone away, and, uh, and which will need to be solved. Thanks again for, for, for organizing uh, Jörg and 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 and, and thank you for for, for the great uh, cooperation we have. Now thank you very much uh, for our bigger brother joining our birthday party. Um, I just go straight into questions. Maybe I just have the privilege of chipping one in the direction of Phil. 
You know, these days everyone talks about WHO, so I'm very happy that you mentioned WTO. Um, and uh, could you just maybe uh, tell us your expectations? What is the role of WTO uh, post uh, COVID? Well, it's crucial, uh, Jörg, that you mention this because uh, if you don't have a global referee, uh, well, then there's no point in doing trade agreements. And uh, the WTO for the last 25 years has done what it can to resolve disputes uh, between uh, in, uh, countries in a very independent way. Regrettably, the United States has uh, tried to recreate the, the old system of GATT uh, by the manner in which it has stopped the uh, appellate body members from being uh, appointed uh, and therefore we don't have a, an independent impartial appeal system in place at the WTO. Uh, this is a, uh, it's a pity. I think that we need the WTO more than ever now because we need to lift restrictions that are being put in place because of this pandemic are being used as an excuse in, in, uh, as part of this uh, global pandemic and we need to have a guarantee of open rules-based trade on a multilateral basis. And this is what the European Union is fighting for. And uh, we have set up, with the help of a 19 other member countries of the WTO, uh, recently a stopgap uh, measure for arbitration, which will help to adjudicate on disputes between uh, the members uh, that have joined. I expect that more members will join in the coming weeks. So it will provide a critical mass of countries uh, to adjudicate on about 65% of trade disputes between us, which is a, a good first step. Uh, and hopefully the United States will join in due course. Uh, but uh, I think that it will be unlikely that that will happen before the next presidential elections in November. Uh, thank you, Phil. I, I would like uh, just the three of you to cherry pick uh, parts of my questions. You know, I mean, public opinion matters in our democracy back home in Europe. Uh, and of course, the mood seems to be shifting after uh, Europe has been very uh, forthcoming in help in public opinion on China. This has dramatically changed. Now, if you look into the Bertelsmann survey on Europe uh, that was actually done in December and came out in January, you see that actually 45% of our population believe that China is a competitor and 25% say it's a partner. And when it comes to particular critical parts, 6% um, uh, of the respondents trust Chinese companies to handle uh, digital areas, whereas 20% uh, feel comfortable with American producers. The question I was asking you, maybe, first of all, is to what extent is business and uh, politics driven by public opinion? Because we as leaders have in the way to set the stage and reach out to China and discuss with China. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, the second is, uh, uh, what do you expect China to do in order to overcome uh, this, this problem, this image problem also, uh, that has been gathering speed over the last six, seven weeks? Well, maybe, Jörg, I might take this first because I deal with politicians on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, <laughs> our trade ministers and I, we regularly interact. And uh, the perception I'm getting now is that there is an appetite to strengthen our trade defense measures, to look at foreign direct investment screening, to recognize uh, that there is a threat to some of our vulnerable sectors and companies. And therefore, we need to watch these things very carefully in the context of the present pandemic. Uh, and uh, because of the financial crisis, that's an economic crisis that's going to happen in the coming months and couple of years. Uh, we have to help our companies to be able to adjust to these realities with the, with the necessary strengthening of our, of our toolbox. And this is what we're trying to do with the foreign direct investment screening, but also the international procurement instrument. And secondly, in relation to your second question about the Chinese, uh, I, think, I think the Chinese, uh, certainly the impression I get during the course of our negotiations and our investment side, is that they realize that the, that the openness of the European market will not stay forever. Uh, and that they have to make some changes and respond to the concerns of European companies uh, when, we, when we regularly state that the, it's not acceptable that the uh, subsidization of state-owned enterprises uh, attacking the market share of our European companies continues as it is. And using the neighborhood countries in order to beam in competition as well 
uh, to our European companies with, uh, with heavily subsidized uh, uh, firms in perhaps in North Africa or our Eastern neighborhood as well is not acceptable. So we are putting a lot of pressure on the Chinese in these negotiations to realize once and for all that if they want to have uh, uh, better respect in the global world of trade, that you have to have a level playing field and that we cannot accept uh, the continued uh, ex exploitation uh, of market share by heavily subsidizing their companies at, uh, at the expense of the markets of, uh, that are available on a fair competition basis for European companies. So this is the way in which I see things developing. Can I? This is Jacob. Can I comment? Please, please, Jacob. No, I, I think, uh, I, I, I mean, obviously in, in business we see exactly the same thing. We see the increased uh, uh, pressures from society at large and, and, and affecting the political environment. And, and of course, that's impossible. That's important to pay respect to. However, I think in a slightly longer term perspective, I think one has to be quite careful here. Uh, uh, I think it's really important to, to, to underline the power of market forces, competition, to allow free trade, uh, and, and to, to continue on, on that path. Yeah. Now, of course, it means that we have to, that, that all players have the, the level playing field principle and all, all of this. But uh, as we have seen during the COVID-19 uh, uh, process is, is that local political uh, pressures have locked in uh, 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 products in different countries not being allowed to move over uh, borders, etc. Those are exactly the, kind, the kinds of consequences you don't want to see happen for political reasons. So, so I, 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 we need to find the balance here as we move forward, as much as I appreciate that there are tremendous pressures here and now. And when it comes to China and their reaction, I can only agree with the commissioner that, that, that of course, uh, as I tried to argue in my, in my remarks, how important it is that, that uh, 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 our partners in, in China uh, are, are transparent and, and uh, that, that there is truly uh, a level playing field, not only in words, but, but in practice. Thank you. Marcus, you want to say something? Yes, yeah, thank you, Jörg. Well, I mean, I, I had a look at the survey, of course, and of course, this these trends are, are a reality. At the same time, uh, one always needs to be cautious with this service. I mean, we, we also had a survey a while ago, which basically underlined that in quite a couple of EU countries, there was more trust in Russia than in the US. So, <laughs> so it's, always very, um, it's always very much driven by, by, by let's say, by, 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 let's, by, by movement of, of the moment. But, of course, there is an underlying certainty because when we as Business Europe, after long debate and the full year's debate with all our members, moved in the direction to say we need to be more assertive with China, we have not achieved what we wanted to achieve with the means we have applied so far in the last 10 years, and we will need to provide ourselves with a toolbox and new instruments. I mean, this is very much driven by business and not by the and by the experiences business is making and not by, uh, by public opinion. At the same time, of course, it's very important to underline that, uh, that we need to do this on the basis of, uh, of open markets. Uh, but what we also say to our Chinese friends is they will decide and they will show to the world whether the European way to deal with them or whether the US way to deal with them will be more successful. And if, in a confidential way, there will be the impression at the end that the US way, uh, which God knows we don't share uh, the view, uh, will be more successful. This will have an impact on, on how other countries will be dealing with China. So therefore, I mean, this is to underline once again what I said before. Uh, it will be very much also for our Chinese friends to, to allow for the steps and to make the steps, which will allow to, to, to level the playing field and to balance which could allow us to do what we want to do is to rather deepen and strengthen the relationship, but, but there will need to be balancing steps in order to allow for this. Thank you, Marcus. I, you know, 
living here in China, the ambassador myself, we come across very often the question um, uh, when it comes to crunch time, is Europe going to be with the US or is Europe going to be with us here in China? Now, do we actually have to choose or can we just be simply Europe? Could you ask that question again, Jörg? I missed that. Yeah, uh, no, the question that uh, the ambassador, uh, Shapui and myself very often get is, uh, you know, uh, from the Chinese side, uh, uh, if the going gets tough, uh, are you with us or are you not with us? A similar question you get from Washington. Uh, so where is Europe? Do we have to choose? Oh, yeah. Is it a binary choice? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, well, yes. Well, first of all, can I thank Ambassador Chapuy and his team for doing a lot of work to help European companies to overcome a lot of barriers and problems in procuring and getting supplies of medical equipment and medical, uh, very important PPE to the European uh, continent and the European countries. Uh, and I think were it not for their interaction on many occasions, there would be a lot more frustration on the European side. Uh, now, uh, like what we have said in our political guidelines in this commission, that Europe wants to be a stronger global, act, global actor. So we are setting out what Europe wants. And we did this in, the, in relation to digital trade uh, in February, where we set out the conditions by which you can play with the European uh, market. And we are not making any decision one way or the other, whether they're going to be American or Chinese or any other part of the world that want to participate. We lay out our rules, our conditions, and our platforms, and everybody is welcome to participate as long as it is a fair competition and a level playing field. And this is the message that I convey to China on a regular basis, and we will continue to do so. And I think it's in the interest of China to grapple with this issue now in 2020 and to be able to reassure European uh, uh, their European partners, that there is a, certainly a major effort to come in to the 21st century in relation to trade and to ensure the transparency that we require uh, uh, of Chinese companies is very important in mobilizing the trust uh, in the system. And I think that uh, if we can get that message across and we can achieve in our investment negotiations uh, a lot here, well, well, then we'll have made a lot of progress in terms of the partnership being deepened between China and the European Union. Of course, we trade $3 billion a day with the United States, and we would be very foolish to ignore that and that market. But sometimes the United States have to help us in more greater collaboration in dealing with crises like the one now. I have sent some five, or five ideas to my counterpart in the United States to work together. But if they don't want to work with us, there's not much we can do. We, we will work with everybody that is beneficial to the European cause and to our political guidelines. Thank you very much. Can, can uh, I, I just, yeah, please. Your, can, can I add to that? Uh, I think it's hugely important what the commissioner is saying. Uh, uh, and as a business person, I, I, I firmly stand behind it. Uh, uh, I, I, there, there is a subset here, and it, it comes to standards and standard setting. Yeah, uh, it, it, it would be so highly unfortunate if the world was truly to be, to be divided in different standards. We, we have seen that historically. It, it's at a great cost to the consumer. It's, uh, it makes life much more complicated, etc. So we all have a real incentive to work together, to, find, to, to work with common standards throughout the world as an important example of why collaboration is so uh, uh, important as we move forward. And could I add to that, Jörg, is that, just briefly, we have been advocating this to the United States for the past year to work with us in terms of developing standards and then work with China uh, subsequently. Uh, and we have not got the type of impetus into this discussion that we should. And whether it is regulatory cooperation, conformity assessment, or standard setting, if we don't have the main economies able to set these standards, well, then somebody else will do it. Uh, and therefore, it will. I, I completely agree with the previous speaker uh, who said that we need to have common standards. This is and common and a regulatory cooperation, and all of these issues are very important from the point of view of a level playing field and reducing costs and keeping those European companies competitive. Thank you. May I just, yeah, Marcus, you wanna? Uh, no, just, just very briefly, because I agree with what, what Phil and what, um, what Jacob have said. Uh, 
but it's also very much uh, what what concerns our relationship with the U.S. and and of course one of our messages in Washington is always, I mean, we both want certain changes in Chinese approaches for for our good and for their own good, and we'll only be able to achieve this together at the end of the day. Uh, but of course, we also very much underline achieving it together doesn't mean that we will copy paste every nonsense you're doing. And uh, there needs to be there needs to be a previous debate on what is a decent policy, and what can serve both of our of our of our purposes. And and the good example, of course, I totally agree with the standards. But the good example is of course this looming story we have on the Airbus Boeing. Uh, where again there is some games played and and I think there would be a chance to to set the gold standard not in the sense of technical standards but here for industrial subsidies in the airline industry and then to to make it a global standard but but uh, but there needs to be the political will to to do so Thank you Marcus may I just encourage the audience to chip in the questions we have already six questions in the pipeline uh, here, Jacob Gunter, our lead pen for the reports, is going to basically start uh, going through the list uh, in a minute. I just last point, uh, Marcus mentioned something, Jacob, on the 26th of March, went uh, live in the Financial Times, warning about social unrest uh, and a potential lost generation. He was the first business leader who is sort of trying to wake up people to the fact that there's gonna be not just, we are in a crisis, there might be a crisis around the corner. Um, and uh, I think uh, as uh, he was backed up by his colleagues from the European Roundtable, I was wondering, Jacob, uh, as that was about six weeks ago, uh, do you see that actually political leaders, business leaders are already thinking for the time after? And what is China's role in that? I, I mean, broadly speaking, yes, there, there is uh, a, a much more, uh, uh, there's much more of an effort and a focus on, on debating and talking about how to prepare for the future. Uh, uh, how, how to, what are the important ingredients uh, that are necessary? Uh, I, I think uh, that here, yeah, it's really, really important that the EU collaborates, that the different countries collaborate a lot more than we did in the beginning when we were unprepared. Here we have, and I know that the Commission is on the same track, I think we should support them and, and, and not have our own home-cooked uh, sort of solutions to all the problems. Uh, my, I would like to say, when I raised this issue, my concern was that uh, if, if this is, if the COVID-19 turns out really bad, uh, if, if, what, what will happen is that businesses will suffer and unemployment will increase and, and it will increase significantly and that in turn will create, uh, 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 I mean, so, potential social unrest and, and psychological uh, illness. Uh, and at the end of the day, that means that people will suffer, people will die for those reasons. Uh, while people are also dying from from uh, COVID-19, and and I was just trying to 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 uh, sort of balance the issue that we're talking about lives in both these different uh, uh, tracks, and and we have to find uh, uh, an intelligent way of of balancing as we move forward. When it comes to China, I think as I said, I think it's. Uh, uh, all the help that China can give the rest of the world in terms of information, facts, etc., uh, of their experiences is obviously of, of value. And there is a debate on the American side whether this is credible or not. I'm not the one to judge, but the important thing is collaboration. Uh, uh, that's how we make this system uh, uh, credible and hopefully uh, helping all of us to, 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 to battle the COVID-19. Thank you. Jacob? Perfect. Um, so our first question. Uh, we have, we have uh, with all European um, member states and the EU itself, um, implementing different kinds of investment screening mechanisms, um, many of which seem to be indirectly aimed at Chinese SOEs. Could it be that the end result is that rather than China pushing to open up, we instead see the, uh, the EU 
kind of closing the door a bit? And is this the kind of level playing field that we really want? I guess that is Phil. <laughs> I'm not sure Phil is still there. Well, if say that again, uh, Jörg. Yes, Jacob. Okay, uh, not Jacob Wallenberg, Jacob Günther. Say it again. Yes. Um, so, with uh, many European uh, Union member states and the EU itself imposing uh, certain kinds of investment screening mechanisms uh, that seem indirectly targeting uh, Chinese SOEs, um, is there not concern that this might ultimately result in Europe closing a door? rather than China being able to open the door? And is that the kind of level playing field that we really want? No, that's not the case at all. We, we want fair competition, uh, and we want to have transparency in relation to the rules of, the, of, of engagement. Uh, we set out this in our communication, and it was agreed in the summer with the Chinese in April 2019. So there's nothing new in our, our objective here, and uh, the tools that we're, uh, um, the tools that we're, uh, improving or strengthening at the moment or indeed introducing new ones is to help European companies to be able to have some leverage when we are being treated unfairly. Uh, and it's not good enough that we have in renewable energy sector, for example, constantly being at our European companies being attacked over the years with the result that we have a very small number of companies now in the European Union are able to manufacture uh, the essential uh, components and uh, and, and products that are necessary for a renewable energy sector. They're all practically all uh, manufactured in China or in Asia. So this is an example, but we don't want to see happening in other sectors. So we have to have a level playing field, transparency, and we're hopefully that the investment negotiations with China is going to uh, you know, yield some dividend in relation to this. And uh, I think that the United States and ourselves should be working more closely together as well in relation to industrial subsidies in order to put pressure on China to be able to achieve this level playing field. I would love, of course, if we could place all of this then in the context of the rules that we can adapt to the WTO, uh, where we are every global player and every member of the WTO is signing up to this level playing field and the industrial subsidies. Uh, Phil, as you have to leave in a minute, uh, maybe I uh, just have Jacob throw in the last question at you. Yeah, so we, we have a question from uh, Wolfgang Krieger. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, China has already declared many times that it will not change its state-guided and subsidized economic system as it considers this to be a stabilizing factor uh, for the country. Is it a denial of reality to believe that we can actually achieve something on this? Well, we can deny reality or we can make an effort uh, to try and achieve something. <laughs> and I'm more positive about it. I'm more positive about it. We have in any negotiation, of course, there has to be give and take, but this is a crucial issue. Uh, and uh, like, if we don't achieve transparency and a level playing field vis-a-vis -vis our European companies, well, then how can the European Union member states sign up to a deal? Uh, so if China, if China wants a, a problem on another flank, apart from the problem that they have with the United States, uh, well, then they have to be very careful that they don't actually uh, alienate the, 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 the member states of the European Union in this global problems that we see that they're facing at the moment, particularly from the United States. So I would encourage China to be very, very strong because Europe will be very strong in demanding uh, a level playing field for our EU companies. Yeah, this is Jacob. Can I just turn to the commissioner and, and say from a business point of view, how much we support your attitude and how important it is that the EU takes a firm stand on these issues uh, and uh, in, in our uh, deliberations with uh, our Chinese partners. I think it's absolutely fundamental to work in line with the way you presented it today. And thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, Jörg, can I? Please. Yes. No, I mean, first, I mean, of course, we also very much support Phil in this endeavor, and he knows it. Uh, but uh, I wanted to, so just to underline this, but I wanted to add one sentence on the investment screening before. Answering with a debate we, we had in a, in a EU-China CEO dialogue some years ago, and it was still with, uh, with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Mark Kai and, and your predecessor, Ambassador. And back then, I mean, this was when this investment screening story was freshly out. Uh, Mark Kai was very aggressive. I mean, towards me in this case, I mean, say, how can we do this? And my answer was, 
look, I mean, we are your ally in so far that our aim is to make this a balanced instrument to make sure we don't have too much leeway for political protectionism and to have it based on, uh, on, on clear criteria. But at the same time, I told him, I mean, I don't see why Europe should not have such an instrument. China has instruments and, and sometimes more, how to say, uh, more, uh, more stringent means which are not based on laws to, 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 to do what they want to achieve. The U.S. has a very sharp instrument in going and outgoing, so why should Europe not have such an instrument? It's all about the balance, and we, but we have seen in the process when establishing this instrument that for some member states it meant that for the first time they were at least collecting the data. But at the same time, it's clear Europe needs to stay open for investment. I mean, this goes without saying because we need it and we will always defend it. Well, you're, yes. I want to agree with Marcus there. That is exactly what the, the sentiments of my, my own sentiments and the direction of travel in relation to this. It's maintaining the open uh, trading system, but at the same time not be naive. And we have our companies that if we have a problem, we need to have a, some instrument to be able to help to uh, resolve this problem. And sometimes when we make threats, we have no tools in order to use uh, to help our companies. Uh, it's, it's like uh, you know any particular legislation. Uh, you know, if you have a breach of the legislation, there's a penalty. Uh, but we don't want anybody to breach the legislation. But it's nice to know that the penalty and actions uh, that we could consider are there. At the moment, we don't have them uh, to the necessary strength that we should have. So I, I have to leave you now, York, unfortunately. Uh, I have to go to another event. And, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation of being with you. Yeah, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, and I hope we meet each other in person very soon, either in Brussels or in Beijing. In particular, also, I think uh, the videos is good, but person in person also for you with your Chinese interlocutor is better. And be rest assured, the party is now about to start once you're leaving. Is that because I'm nearly two meters high that I am very important physically to meet these people? <laughs> right, right, right. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Phil. Thank you. All right. Um, our next question comes from Alfredo uh, Montufar. Hello. Uh, how can Chinese companies themselves, um, including SOEs, uh, or sorry, what can Chinese companies themselves do, including SOEs, to increase their receptiveness in Europe, given the current situation? Or does this really depend on the actions of the Chinese states vis-a-vis um, -vis its market um, and uh, its sort of reform efforts there? So who wants to take that? Uh, Jacob here. I, I mean, uh, at the, the individual company, the individual person, of course, uh, should do what, what they think is right. But, but I think, isn't that the whole core here, that, that, that uh, uh, a lot of this is uh, ultimately politically driven uh, from the Chinese side. And, and the, 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 there, there is a dependency on, on a relationship with, with, with the state. Uh, and so back to what, what uh, we've discussed today, uh, that there, there is a need for a, a broader uh, acceptance of level playing field, uh, transparency, etc. Uh, and, um, and I think, I, I really think it is important that Europe makes this uh, clear, not only in words, but in actions, which is not the way we want things to work. Uh, but, but, but I think uh, one has to put down a foot uh, and, or a stick in the ground and, and work from there, uh, which is in line with what the commissioner argued. And, and I think that's the way we have to go. And, and hopefully you know, we, we can find a clear path forward. Okay, you have another one. No, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I mean, of course, there's always things uh, an individual company can do, but but uh, when it's about the overall design, and as we have been proposing, for instance, to have this reversal of the burden of proof uh, on, let's say, the subsidies. I mean, this needs to be this needs to be fixed somewhere, and and there needs to be instruments. And and of course, the the overall let's say the overall interest of the economy might differ from the interest of specific partners in a specific case. Great. All right, our next question comes from uh, Anne Evelyn uh, Luton. 
Um, she's asking specifically about the chemical industry, but I think it's an interesting question more broadly. Uh, what is the risk in general um, and specifically for the EU chemical industry of massive exports from China as they are the first country to be moving um, out of the COVID-19 crisis ahead of all other regions? No, Jürg, this, this, Jürg, this is your, your... I know, I know. Yes, please. I'm shy. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think uh, that, uh, of course, we're worried always about Chinese overcapacity. Um, but again, uh, we don't want to deprive uh, European customers from choice. Uh, so if China comes back first uh, and this material ends up in Europe, uh, it might be actually very helpful for us uh, to have that there. So I wouldn't say that we should be shy of competition. So once Europe opens up again, I think in the chemical industry, uh, Europe is still world champion and uh, we should be ready in order to take on any competitor there is. Uh, you know, the chemical industry is sort of competitor and partner same time, uh, even among companies. Uh, and we are the industry of industry. So in a way, whatever functions first and comes on first, uh, uh, it should be beneficial for everyone else. Yeah, I, this is Jacob, and I, I, I more broadly speaking, uh, I, I agree with that principle. Uh, uh, it's, it's uh, if uh, I, I believe in in free competition, and free free trade, and uh, uh, w within the confines of level playing field, uh, I, I'm perfectly happy with uh, great competitors from other parts of the world, including China uh, at this time. Yes, I mean, free level playing field of fair, of course, uh, not dumping, mm. but we have the mechanisms at least. Go ahead. Okay, um, with the EU having taken its current position when dealing with the Chinese government for so long, um, and yet with these issues still remaining, uh, is there a need for kind of a course correction um, in European policy, in EU uh, and member state policy, um, and how they are engaging with China? Well, uh, may I? My old man, yes, sure. Go ahead, yes, Jess. Good. No, I mean, this is very much, this is very much in the center of, of the paper we had presented at the beginning of the year. I mean, it's driven by, it's driven by the, the conclusion that many things we tried over the last five to 10 years, uh, looking at, at the indicators and the bottom line have not made things better. So therefore we have pro uh, proposed a long set of ideas, how to deal with China differently. On the one hand, on the, the institutional side, and on the other hand, uh, in, in content. So on the institutional side, of course, the idea is to, to, to be more assertive, the idea is to be better informed. This is something what, for instance, the US is doing better than us. So we said we needed some kind of a standing strategic uh, body conference on China where, where the member states, institutes, the institutions come together, share intelligence on China. On the one hand, to, to reduce the possibility of divide and rule, on the other hand, to be on the same page. And we have seen the same in our internal debate. When we started uh, one and a half year ago, we were very far apart. Uh, we had, of course, the, the classical defenders of, of free trade, whatever it costs, and we had those a bit more on the protective side. But the more we went into detail and substance on the China debate, the more we, we, could, we, could, we could bring all members together and we ended up with, with very concrete uh, ideas. So, so the, the answer is yes. I mean, we will need to, to change uh, and, and we'll need to, pres uh, to provide ourselves with the instruments. And we have talked about a couple of examples today in order to, to, to make this change happen. Uh, do, Marcus, you mentioned in your guiding uh, statement that uh, uh, Business Europe did an excellent study, the EU and China addressing the systemic challenge uh, for everyone uh, on, uh, on air, so to speak, uh, you can either go on the Business Europe website or you can contact uh, our Madame Chiu uh, Muyue, uh, who has been organizing this, and her, her email address is in the invitation, and she can then forward it to you. Um, 
there is a decoupling. You know, talk about the European Chamber. Um, we are wondering what to do next. We are, you know, we came up with Made in China 2025. We had uh, kickstart the discussion on social credit system. Uh, in January, uh, we have uh, launched a Belt and Road Initiative uh, paper, um, which we might also talk about, but we are now wondering what's next. And given what Marcus and Jacob said, um, the idea we had a while ago is to do something on decoupling. Uh, we see this as a real challenge and we were wondering how companies uh, are preparing themselves, how much they are aware of this. Um, from the European point of view, uh, the two of you, um, uh, how serious do you see the decoupling uh, discussion going on and what do you think, uh, how can we enrich the discussion uh, when we come up with a paper possibly in December? Uh, J Jacob here. Uh, no, I, I, I think, uh, fr from my perspective, uh, of, of course, there is a debate on, on how, how do we best engage in China and so on. But it's not on a decoupling basis. It, uh, it, it's, it's, it's much more sort of uh, uh, back to today's discussion on, on the uh, uh, level playing field, pushing forward, being a part of the local community, uh, business as usual in a sense uh, that, that, that and that's what I hear and that's what I sense uh, but, but of course there's some difficult uh, uh, it's a difficult time we're in and and the whole uh, political debate China US doesn't uh, improve things of course well I mean I think uh, uh, Jörg I mean this brings us a bit back to the to the question which was raised early on this on this uh, binary question. And, and, and obviously, I mean, the answer for European business and economy is we must avoid at all price that it becomes a binary question because this would, as Jacob said, it's an initial statement, this would, this would destroy a lot of value unnecessarily. So, so we are very concerned by these latest developments in the US and we are in close contacts with our allies there. Uh, that, I mean, they are thinking about instruments which could ask European exporters to China to seek a US-driven export license from the US State Department whenever you have regulated parts, components, and software which is regulated in the US. So, of course, this would be a disaster, and we will need to work on this. And, and for, for your paper, I think it's, it's important to, to show basically the dramatic negative consequences uh, this, this would have on EU business, but at the same time also on US business, I mean, and okay, I mean, I do not want to be naive. I know that facts uh, have not always been the winning, uh, the winning backing in, in, in our talks with Washington recently, but I think we'll need to keep trying. And then we have seen in many fields, like for instance, when it's about, uh, to bring a totally different example, when it's about car tariffs, that, that strong economic evidence, I mean, and the support of, of the US industry in these fields uh, has an impact. May I at the end uh, come to a topic which uh, uh, the ambassador and myself come across here very often. I mean, Europe, in, in particular in the Chinese media, and possibly also in some Anglo-Saxon papers, comes across as uh, uh, very weak, uh, permanently uh, d d uh, having disagreements and so forth. But when you look at the, the uh, Battles Month survey in January, it is surprising to see, A, how proud Europeans are with their own industry. 40% really trust them, and that's actually in comparison to 70% for US and 6% or 5% for, um, for Chinese products, which might actually be interesting in the 5G discussion. But also when the survey was asking, are you satisfied or are you supporting the EU's China policy? And there was a very strong uh, support uh, going forward there. So with all of this, I mean, we have uh, a system here which basically has only one opinion. We have uh, an American system with uh, strong opinions and hurricane of anger, so to speak. And we have Europe that normally always has a cacophony of opinions. But at the same time, it looks like we possibly are more resilient than we actually look like. So what's your take on how Europe comes out of this and uh, how do you see that uh, COVID-19, with all the challenges that Jacob outlined in the Financial Times, could we possibly come out of this 
stronger. <laughs> Easy question for the end. <laughs> All right, right, right. Now, I, I think, Jacob here, uh, I, uh, I, I think that uh, if there's any silver lining to the terrible situation we're going through now, I mean, I, I think it's perfectly clear this will hurt the world significantly. But the silver lining is maybe that we also see the dependence we have on each other. We see the value of collaborating with each other. Yeah, we, we, we see the value of, of people being, you know, human, helpful. It might sound very soft, but I think we all are going through a, a, a very deep learning or learning, maturing process. Yeah, yeah, being locked up at home, uh, seeing the disasters yeah, happening to, to small businesses, large businesses, travel yeah, is, is non-existent, yeah, etc. It's a very different world. And I think yeah, there is something hopefully positive coming out of this. Yeah, but, but from an economic point of view, of course, this is not great. Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, we, as, as we have been saying, I mean, this is the the hardest hit since since the almost 100 years so so it's so it's very negative but what i can say is of course we do everything to to draw the lessons and to try to improve the mechanism and there's of course also uh encouraging signals so for instance i mean at european level we see that certain things have become rapidly possible which would have been unthinkable a month ago or or two months ago and i mean and we also see how our positions are moving, like, for instance, on the shore, you know, this, this mechanism to support the member states in order to keep people in the job. Even so, we, we do not want to see it as a permanent instrument and as a temporary one. I mean, we, we have supported it because we, we have seen the necessity to have, to, to, to have keep people in work. The same for, for the recovery fund. I mean, we're not yet there, but I think we have a good chance now to mobilize fresh money jointly in order to 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 kick start the economy as well of course of course this will need to be done in, in a prudent and balanced way but it's it's also something which would not have been possible uh, a couple of months uh, ago but but we are not there but i mean it looks better than it has looked uh, than it has looked before and and then of course for us i think the main story will then be that this money, because now it's the fight of having the money, but then we need to be very much aware. I mean, this money is not falling from the from the sky. I mean, this money uh, will be need to be paid back by will need to be paid back by by two generations or so, and this means we will need to use this money well. And and it's very important. And this is something we are in deep discussions with the Commission. It's very important to to develop instruments in order to make sure that once the money is there, it will be used well. And one trigger will be the European semester, other maybe this economic, this industrial ecosystems uh, Commissioner Breton is developing, but there needs to be something to make sure that this money is not, is not, uh, is, is spent in order to make us stronger. And maybe on a more general term, because we had a lot of debates in the last days with our companies, uh, what is the biggest challenges and there was there was a summary made i think which is interesting there are three things one is to to make sure that the corona restrictions don't become permanent i mean this is goes for in this in inside the single market and this of course goes for global value chains and we have seen this after the crisis of 2008 that unfortunately some of the things which were meant to be short term became permanent the second and of course this is a bit interesting to discuss it in the china debate it will be a big challenge to because now we need strong states and it's not po not possible without the state taking a leading role but after the crisis we will need to make sure that the state is going back to its natural role and i think this will also be a debate because we we must not go back to a time where a state thinks that they are the better entrepreneurs because then uh, then then this is this is the dangerous development and the third, of course, is, is, the, is the restructuring of the value chains, but this we've already talked about. 
Thanks, Marcos. We're heading towards 5 here in China and 11 a.m. in Europe. So last question from my side. Uh, uh, in uh, January, the Chamber did this customary survey. Um, and uh, of course, that's like doing a survey in April 1914. Uh, so we had to actually ditch a couple of things because definitely the world has totally changed. And we drew on the findings, not only from a second little survey we did, but also from the Germans, French, Italians, in particular also from the Austrian chamber here. Um, and it will be launched on the 10th of June by my colleague, uh, Charlotte Ruhl, the vice president of the chamber. Now, one of the findings I can disclose is that less than 10% of our members said they are considering to move away from China. Now, there is a discussion going on about diversification. Now, uh, from your point of view in Europe, what is the appetite of European companies there in the headquarters? Do they seriously think about maybe they want to move out of China? Or are they actually looking at the fact that China might not be the only country now uh, in order to invest in diversification is actually addressing the issue of future investment? Uh. Jacob here. Uh, I, I, as I said a minute ago, I, I think that the, the companies I interact with, they have a, a very clear view on a long-term commitment to China. Uh, uh, the, the question of moving out of China is, is not on the table anywhere that I know of. Uh, you, you, most of the companies uh, I know have been in China over 30 years. They have uh, everything from uh, R&D, production, distribution service, uh, the, the whole cycle, yeah, yeah, and, and a significant amount of, of employees and, and a very sincere commitment to the market. Uh, I think this remains. Uh, there are some important questions that we've discussed today. Uh, of course, the, the, the more we can develop those questions, uh, uh, the, the better exchange we can have, but the underlying commitment and, and engagement in the Chinese market uh, is, is very strong to the best of my knowledge. Marcus, yeah. Yes, well, of course, I mean, this, this differs from company to company, but in principle, I, I would agree. I think there's no, there's no, there's trends we had before which have been reinforced by the crisis that, that you're looking at diversification of value chains, um, we also have seen also since 2008 some reshoring, but, but a lot driven by, by robotics and automation. So I think this is something which will, of course, continue. And that's also interesting to see that you see big difference, differences within Europe. And uh, there seems to be a chance for, for some Eastern and Central European countries who are, who are well on track here. But, 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 but overall, I think we will see a balancing uh, but but I don't see I, I don't see a, a strong push at the time being. It's maybe also a bit too early to tell, and and, and I would totally agree with Jacob. I think those who have been there for a long time, uh, the long term commitments uh, are, are not put in question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you in particular, of course, Marcus in Austria and Jacob uh, in Sweden, but also would like to extend uh, my sincere thanks to Ambassador Chapuis. Nicola, thank you for hosting us uh, here today. Uh, we have Europe Day on the May 9th. Uh, that was uh, for us important uh, to do it today with our commissioner as well as to do it in the delegation. Thank you for your patience and have a nice weekend. Thanks for listening to our webinar playback series. We hope you enjoyed the content and that you're eager to listen to the rest of the episodes. Thanks as well to our guests, Chamber President Jörg Wutke, and my colleagues Zhang Yicher and Gao Rei for handling the editing and content on the back end. This has been Jacob Gunter at China Dispatches, the official podcast of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. Thanks for listening.